I wanted to welcome everyone. My name is Indra Mungle, and I work in the education department at the Asian Art Museum. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's virtual program and a very special welcome to the writers who will be sharing their work with us today, to the writing instructors who, uh, who led the Interdisciplinary Writers Lab this summer and the Kearney Street Workshop staff. The Asian Art Museum really deeply values our partnership with Kearney Street Workshop. This has been the past few years we've been able to partner with them and we are very also very honored to sponsor the Interdisciplinary Writers Lab, which is usually held on site at the museum. Sadly, not this year, but we're hoping for next year. Please note that this program is being recorded and will be up on our YouTube station in a few days. So you get to relive the, the readings. I know for me, it takes a few times to, to hear the words and, and on different levels. It's, there's a lot of depth to this work. And before I turn this over to Kearney Street Workshops Director Jason Bayani, I wanted to acknowledge that the Asian Art Museum sits on the San Francisco Peninsula and is located within the occupied territories of the Ohlone peoples, the Ramaytush and coastal Miwok. We remember their continued connection to this region and give thanks to them for allowing us to live, work, and learn on the traditional homeland. We offer our respect to the elders and to all indigenous peoples past and present and truly indigenous people all over the world who are greatly under siege as, as we know from environmental climate disasters. So hold, hold indigenous people in our hearts and minds. And now I'd like to turn this over to Jason Bayani, exec, the D executive director of Kearney Street Workshop to take it away. Welcome. Hi, how's everyone doing? Hope you all are uh, staying safe from the smoke out there right now. Uh, I know it's been a bit of a heavy couple days. Um, you know, and thank you. We thank you for taking the time uh, to join us in supporting um, our 2020 fellows for Interdisciplinary Writers Lab. Um, just to give you a little background. Um, oh yeah, my name is Jace Lani. I, I'm the Artistic Director at Kearney Street Workshop. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we are a uh, we are a 48-year-old arts organization here in San Francisco, um, Asian-Pacific uh, Asian American arts organization. Uh, we've been going for, for a minute here. Um, IWL is one of our programs. Um, it's been running since 2005, I believe, um, and uh, has went through many different iterations. And currently, um, currently we are partnered up here with uh, Asian Art Museum uh, has been really good to us the last couple of years. Um, and so IWL started as a uh, means to kind of create uh, a space outside of mainstream institutions uh, for BIPOC spreaders um, here in the Bay Area. Um, we wanted to create something that was a little bit different um, that could give, um, give uh, folks here in the Bay Area, uh, an opportunity to, uh, you know, kind of take a master's level class, uh, but also to explore all the different genres of writing. And this year we had some amazing instructors uh, teaching uh, in poetry. We had Barbara Jane Reyes. Uh, in fiction, we had Ingrid Rojas Contreras. And in creative nonfiction, uh, we had Vanessa Waugh three amazing writers and we were so happy uh, we were able to get them to be our instructors. So each of our students uh, spent four weeks with each of the instructors learning and exploring different genres. All the writers here, some write multi-genre, uh, others are, have were exploring poetry or, or, or fiction in you know this kind of intensive in a new way. So, you know, it was really great to, uh, you know, have them be a part of it. And um, yeah, so that's kind of our program. If you have questions about our program, please feel free to contact us at info at We will be um, opening up 
applications again in February. Um, so yeah, you know, we do this every year and uh, hopefully we'll be back in the museum by next summer. Uh, but this year, you know, we did it all online. All of our students kind of, uh, you know, were able to weather that and um, really created something special. And that's the thing with this type of programs, like, you know, we, we want to be able to, you know, uh, allow the students to take it to kind of like not only uh, learn how to uh, increase their skills as writers, but to also be able to create community for themselves um, here as writers in the Bay Area. So um, I wanted to jump into this. I don't want to take too long with this intro. Um, each of our writers, uh, we got are going to are uh, going to introduce the next person. So we are going to kick off with Ratana Yang. Um, Ratana is an emerging writer living in Oakland, California. She writes about displacement, memory, trauma, and Cambodia. When he's not writing, he works as a data analyst for the Oakland Unified School District, and he volunteers as a court-appointed special advocate to support abused, neglected, and abandoned children who are dependents of juvenile courts. Please give it up for Ratana. Hello, hello, welcome, thank you. Thank you uh, for creating this space uh, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Um, my name is Rutana um, and a lot of my writing in the past couple of years has focused mostly on um, memoir and nonfiction. Um, uh, there were sessions of this, this uh, get together that we had that focused on short stories and, and poetry and poetry, I, I will say specifically, was something that I've, I've always struggled with. I've struggled like reading poetry and I've struggled even just like imagining what I could write in terms of poetry. And I didn't think um, it was something that I would even attempt at like any point in my life. But uh, the four weeks that I had with everybody in this program uh, related to uh, poetry under Barbara uh, was just so inspiring. Everybody was so supportive and and so willing to share and offer you know bits of themselves and and, and constructive feedback i i literally spent two weeks like sitting down and trying to put something down on paper that resembled something i think that can be considered uh poetry so i ended up creating uh writing a little poem which i never thought i would see myself doing and um that's essentially what i'm going to share with you guys uh today um, it's very brief, um, but it's um, essentially about uh, some time that I had spent in Cambodia uh, during Phnom Penh, uh, which is a 15-day religious holiday um, that uh, that exists to uh, gives an opportunity to sort of like honor those that have passed, like in our community. Uh, so, without further ado, the only poem I've ever written in my life. Let me just pull it up here. Okay, here it goes. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, I see a lot of thumbs ups and smiles. Okay, great. <clears throat> what to make of family trees where abandoned remains or what remains gathered from solitary plots left unnamed now on display. A memorial for millions to be forgotten for there are no ashes here today. And that was my poem. So thank you for giving me the, the chance and courage to, <laughs> to write that and now share it with all of you. Um, so I'm gonna transition quickly uh, I have uh, the distinct pleasure of introducing um, ECAT, um, full name Ekaterina Burton. ECAT is a writer, neuroscience nerd, and community organizer living in Oakland, California. ECAT is a non-binary Swiss Filipinx queer who grew up a military brat in a multiracial family under two immigrant Marines. Since childhood, they have been wrestling with the themes of structural violence and its interpersonal discontent. Colonization continued through imperialism and reclaiming indigeneity within global hegemonies. Uh, when not lost in big existential thoughts, ECAT is dancing their ass off, hiking, and creating playlists. Um, please give a warm welcome to ECAT. Thanks, Ratsana. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be sharing three poems. And uh, excuse me if this is, I'm not. I'm going to stumble one or two times, so here we go. First poem. Inquiry to six-year-old self at 2.30 in the morning. Was it that dollar, the one your mom kept in her jewelry box 
when you saw the red circle bleeding into the green and the outline of the words between silence equals death. Was it that dollar that made you decide? You must have been able to read by then, not just words, but their consequences, not just actions, but their futures. Silence equals death. You had already swallowed both death of your innocence, silence about the violence, the members of the family that always screamed the loudest, your companions. They accompanied you everywhere in the nights you woke up in pure sweat of hearing fist pound flesh. In the days you feared footsteps leading towards your bedroom door. In the crying you always did alone after when sometimes you couldn't tell if you were breathing or not because you are holding your lungs hostage so they don't feel more pain. Silence equals death. They were whispered into your ears, your guardian angels, promises or threats. You could read danger at that point, see it coil in the neck before it locked in the jaw and unloaded from clenched hands. Stay between the lines and be safe, right? Don't tell anyone. I'll kill her. This is our secret. Silence equals death. Was it that dollar that made you do it? That clicked the equation in your heart between fear and injustice? Tired of being trapped in an oblivion you were forced to swallow? When did you figure out that parents lie, that words promised futures, that actions inscribed patterns, a pattern you could read for all of your life, a pattern you escaped to save your life, a pattern you broke when you spoke and said. Uh, so this next poem, uh, is dedicated uh, to everyone right now. I hope you can take a deep breath and settle into it. Maybe close your eyes. It's called, Our Glory Is Here. Kindred, there is a meadow where the grass is lush for us to walk free. We will feel the peace of trees and our feet, we are bare, unfettered, as our voices rise in the jubilee of casting off all the chains we had long ago locked around our own beauty. I do not need to pray for us. I will be on the other side of that field waiting to embrace you alight with your glory and whisper in your ear, rejoice, O oh, beloved, we are finally home. And this last poem is uh, called Daluyan, uh, which is the Tagalog word for vessel, and it's dedicated to all the boat people of the world. We are the path we are the way forward. We are the breath leading into the unknown. We are the past. We are the waves forward. We are the breaths creating the unknown. We are paths. We ocean ways. Our collective breath liberating the known. And I just want to dedicate this to my two um, grandmothers, uh, Oma. Ruth Weber and Lola Avelina Cuevas, and I'm excited to introduce you all to our next uh, artist. She's multi-talented. Her name is Alexand Alexandra Sui, and her um, she also goes by Ali. She is a Chinese American filmmaker born and raised in Orange County, California. She is currently living in San Francisco where she's developing her first feature film, Queens with the SF Film, Film House Residency. Her short films, Sophie and Our Way Home have screened at over 20 film festivals around the world. Ali was featured artist in the film in last year's AP, AP Future Arts Festival. 
can take it away. Well, you can't say that. Congratulations on your three poems and thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, thank you so much to Kearney Street Workshop and Asian Art Museum for putting on our reading virtually. And we're also grateful for the last three months with Ingrid, Barbara Jane and Vanessa and one another. Um, when I came into our writer's lab, I came with the intent of really looking into my relationship and connections with my great grandparents. And so I'm sharing a piece which will actually be in our um, class chat book. Um, it's called My Great Grandmother and Me. And thank you also, also so much everyone for coming. Um, Zhang Yui is one of China's most well-known historical figures born in 1900. Today, she is seen by many young women as an inspiration, breaking traditions and glass ceilings during her time. She is my great grandmother. My aunt, Natasha Bong Mei Chang, wrote a biography about her, Bound Feet Western Dress, where she alternated between her telling of Gil Yi's oral stories while telling her own story. Since its publication in 1996, I think it's time for an update, an added perspective from younger generations, especially in our ongoing Me Too movement. In Bound Feet Western Dress, my great grandmother said, quote, in China, a woman is nothing, end quote. To me, Yo Yi became something. She had to fight for her trans transformations. She had to fight for a life that she wanted. She defied all expectations in her family and in soci society. When Yo Yi was a young girl in a family of 12, her brothers were all able to go to school. It was at the end of the Qing Dynasty when new girls' schools were formed. Yo Yi was looking, for, looking in the newspaper, Shen Bao, found an advertisement for a girls' school in Suzhou. She proposed the idea to her parents of her attending, and they agreed to allow both her and her elder sister to attend. At 15 years old, Yo Yi married my great grandfather, Xu Zhimo, who became China's renowned romantic poet. Their, um, their marriage was arranged by Yo Yi's parents and one of her brothers. Jimo went to the U.S. for two years to continue his education, primarily in political studies and economics. After, he and yo -Yi met up in Europe. While he was becoming friends with the Bloomsbury group, hanging out with fellow Chinese friends, and falling in love with poetry, yo -Yi was left alone in their home in Sauston. yo, -Yo -Yi barely spoke English. She would find out from a mutual friend and by letter that Jimo wanted to divorce her. Divorce in China was not legal prior to their divorce and was frowned upon at the time. It wouldn't be until 1950 when women in China were permitted to initiate divorces. In 1922, she agreed and signed the papers. Yo Yu would settle in Berlin shortly after, bringing their newborn, raising him completely on her own. She had a female com German companion, Dora, who helped her and empowered her. She studied German for a few months with a language tutor and Dora would help her help Yo Yi um, apply to a school formed on the studies of a Swiss educator where she focused on kindergarten teaching. N Natasha quoted Yo Yi, quote, I always think of my life as before Germany and after Germany. Before Germany, I was afraid of everything. After Germany, I was afraid of nothing, end quote. Yo Yi returned to China five years later and became a German lecturer at Dongwu University in Shanghai. After spending years, several years in England and Germany, she raised Jumo and her son, Shikai. She would later become the vice president of the Shanghai Women's Bank, Women's Savings Bank, as well as the general manager of the Yun Chang clothing store, known especially for their cheap house. Chinese, China was become, slowly becoming more modern, and she succeeded in becoming an accomplished woman who wasn't dependent on anyone. Natasha mentioned that Yoi was humble and felt undeserving of her role, particularly as the VP of the bank. I'm sure that she didn't even know that she was empowering others and certainly didn't know that she would influence women today. I've been an artist since I was born, a storyteller since I was eight, a filmmaker since I was 15. People had always observed how I knew exactly what I wanted to do since I was young. If I were to look objectively at my great grandmother's life, she went from education to banking and business. While China was experiencing the fall of the last emperor, shifting from a traditional culture to modernity, and then both the Chinese Civil War and the Second Sino-Japanese War. I've been blessed to have a family which supports me, my artistic endeavors. However, I do feel that I have different challenges. I grew up in an area that was predominantly white. I've experienced racism without even knowing it or realizing it. 
Like the time that my classmate pulled his eyes back in a slanted eye gesture when I was in elementary school. People make assumptions about me just because I'm an Asian woman. Prior to COVID-19, a male producer was surprised I was a good driver. When the virus was first detected in Washington state, I sneezed at a local supermarket in Orange County, California, and a white woman behind me half jokingly asked, do you think that's the virus? Unfortunately, today we are all struggling as women not being treated equally to men. And now as one of only a few Asian female directors in America, there is of course jealousy, scarcity, the fact that only a few Asian female directors can have a seat at the table. There are expectations that all directors should be a certain way, especially in America, and clear double standards between men and women. Female directors can't be too confident, nor can they be unconfident. As, a re as I reflect on my great grandmother's life, I would have loved to sit down with her and take the time to get to know her, understand her life, her loves and her hardships and learn from her life journey. I got to know a script consultant as a filmmaker re in residence at SF Film. She encourages filmmakers and screenwriters to look at the moments in their life when their perspective on life shifted or changed to inform our scripts. And I'm struck by my great grandmother's three moments, asking for an education like her brother's moving to Germany to establish a new life on her own and becoming the VP of the Shanghai Women's Savings Bank during a financial crisis while also becoming the general manager of the clothing store. I know that in my lifetime, I've had one difficult experience as a producer on a film production that changed and shifted my perspective on the importance of being a good leader as a director. And I know I, know I should be looking to my great grandmother for the inspiration, strength and resi resilience to the career that I want as a director. Thank you. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Sarah D. Park. Um, I was so happy to know that somebody else from my colleges, from my undergraduate colleges, was also in this lab. And uh, Sarah D. Park uh, is a Korean American writer and performer whose, works poke, whose work pokes at the intersection of race, body, and faith in Asian American stories. She also serves as a story producer and writer for Inheritance Magazine and manages communications for Project Peace East Bay. Sarah grew up in Southern California, like myself, uh, drinking jasmine milk tea with boba, full sugar, less ice. Thank you so much, Ali, for being so generous with your story. Um, I was hesitant to share my piece today because it's a story in my life that I've grown quite tired of. Uh, it's the story that I would tell boys to see if they'd fall in love with me in high school. It's the story that got me into college. And it's the story that I thought ended but came back again. So I can't quite seem to shake this particular story. Um, and it forced me to ask myself if this is the only interesting story in my life. And I, I refuse to believe that. <laughs> Uh, so I want to thank our instructors, Ingrid, Barbara, and Vanessa. I will write my way into the truth that we are more expansive than we know. Thank you for teaching me how to play again and for modeling how this magic that we love gets made. Uh, so the story that I will be sharing today is a prose poem myth. <laughs> uh, it's called Parable of the Plague. Two babies are born on the same day in the same apartment complex. A firstborn son and I, a firstborn daughter. So bright they sparkled, Amma says. Your eyes sparkled and I knew you were smart. And Appa's wide grin says, Amen. The firstborn son has a beaming harmony and Appa drives her crazy. My eyes, the light of his days, what a superior child. To prove his love for me, Appa once tasted my poo and tasted my pee, watched me squeal in horror and delight as he did it, so proud of the lengths that he'd go. Oma cannot confirm nor deny. Appa plants an undeniable kiss on my face in the church courtyard, the food court, that all might bear witness, I am beloved. Then a plague on my body of too much of something no one can name. Mysterious are God's ways to send a plague but harden the heart that we might see some glory. Oma bears it in tears suspended. 
She asked God if they loved me too much. Appa bears it in a wearied face turned away. He cannot look at my eyes for long now. On our drives home from the hospital, I lie down stretched across the back seat and scavenge a few recognizable words of murmured hunger. I do not understand and neither do they. Their dreams for me inflame into a persistent plea, appease the plague with a sacrifice. With a smaller life, a dimmer light, I'm bled often to confirm that I am living humbly. And the women in my family clasp their hands to better bang on the door of heaven. How long? How much? How could you? The plague then comes for my brother's beloved, a newly minted sister. She has a certain shine. We must be doing something right for the enemy is coming after us, she says. Perhaps we are destined for something more. But why is this happening? The fruit of this question sours and rots in my hands. What glory? The altar is drenched with my family's devotion, yet God sends no fire. What do you want? And the plague responds, to be loved as you are. Love me and I will set you free. Thank you for listening. Um, and now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our next writer, Antmen Pimentel Mendoza. Antmen is a Scorpio, Bacala, and writer based in Richmond, California. He works and dreams alongside students at the University Cultural Center. Uh, her poetry is published in Cosmonauts Avenue, Underblong, and Homology Lit. Antmen is online as at Antmen is Magic. Hello. Thank you, friends, for being here. Thank you to Kearney Street Workshop, the Asian Art Museum. Thank you to our instructors, Ingrid, Barbara Jane, Vanessa. And thank you especially to the cohort. Um, it's such a pleasure to write alongside and toward and with all of y'all. I have a couple of poems I'm going to read today. <clears throat> Huzzle for the end of the word. Once we leave this language behind, we'll speak to each other in dream pictures and maps all we've survived till each other. I'll abandon these limbs, be someone more serpentine, earth-bellied, leather-egged, and quick-tongued. Still, we'll know each other. A fact, the spikes in blood sugar make me enjoy cookies a whole lot less. Hope I stay within your warm reach, mother. I have a Word doc I've saved under the file name 30 by 30. Make peace with my body, we promise each other. The lizard baby in me says, lights, camera, action. He means fight or flight. Keep the show going for each other. Maybe our flesh betrays our secret stinks, a perverse folk legend, the same yellow way birds warble with each other. Auntie asks me, are we the same kind of brown? And I hear, do we take the same route home? A way we hold each other. We dream, sardined across the floor, of the king's feast we'd cook but can't, menudo, bistec, okoy, on night for each other. Thank you. My second poem is called Origin Story, Practical Sainthood. I am devout, but at a price. You could say that my God's no good. I do. Wrist deep into his favorite margin of me, I am reminded most folk think sainthood's a gift. Most folks don't know it's the ride share you order at last call with no better options. Sainthood isn't a decision or state like nirvana or love, but just a way to be a cavity, practice or a canon of practices. Some bad gods cheat on wives, bastard some kids, or kill their pantheon. My God's known to evade the IRS. Even still, I wanted sainthood like the first long day of summer. Once Mercano saw the mountaintops. They fabled monsters dwelling there, echoed those same myths till I greet every GI's son or daughter I meet in my freshman door, dorm. Hey, fun fact, boondocks is the only loan word in English from a Philippine language. Once 1987. Once 
A man entered me, not with flesh, only a colder blade. And I lost the limits of my skin and forgot my name. Those ways I knew to declare, I. Once a boy walked the face of every moon that caught him pink, and he called it a gift, called it privilege. Once from Tatai's bukid, you could see Ta'al. What did Frank practice anyway? Taking walks and thinking about friends, eating burgers and drinking pop. When did the breathing start? Was it always in beat with your own? What did Brandy say about Adrian in season three? And was it all that bad? Which peak do you envision when the guide asks you to empty blue? Whose moon am I? Which girlhood do we mourn tonight? Mirror bald night, baby's breath subtle night, softest of Nanai's dreams tonight. What shape to take come the morning? Someone I can desire or disassemble with all parts condemned, some beast more delicate with less to spare. Thank you. Those are my two poems. Um, and I'm excited to introduce our next reader, our next performer, uh, Jenny. Jenny Chi is a writer and scientist, a child of survivors of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. She grew up mostly in Las Vegas and moved to San Francisco to complete her PhD in cancer biology. Her essays and poems have been published in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Tin House, Rattle, Ziziva, and elsewhere. She is completing her first poetry collection titled Focal Point, versions of which have been a finalist for the Jake Adam York Prize and the Crab Orchard series in poetry. I'm very excited to introduce a very talented Jenny. Thank you so much, ant -Man. That was beautiful. And thank you, Kearney Street Workshop, the Asian Art Museum, our instructors, and the rest of my cohort for all of your support and this very necessary community in this difficult year. I wrote a whole blog about my gratitude, so I'll keep this part short. <laughs> I'm going to read two poems today as well. I've also got a guzzle, my first ever, actually. Thank you, Barbara Jane. I'll start with that one. Take this body. There are 30 trillion cells birthed from the first ancestral cell in this body. Every single cell has inherited the same instructions for mapping this body. What is it like to move about the world without feeling weight? Every choice, not choice, heavy with millennia of blood, blades, flesh, trapping this body. When I was five, a boy brought a model heart to show and tell. Blue beads rattled against plastic veins. My heart pumps blue blood in wrapping this body. Once I was a child in the library, a man stooped to ask for help finding books. When my mother found me, I felt the newness of danger overlapping this body. How many times did I look in the mirror, pinch flab on my arms, my hips, even my eyelids? Count my inheritance, measure shames racking this body. I used to run at night when I boiled over, tried my best to run past fear, past grief, past rage, past nerves, past me running circles, battling this body. When I was 20, I went to the hospital weak with fever. That week, a machine breathed for me. I was a machine overheating, loss sapping this body. Asked about my relationship with food, I talk about my mother, blood, waste, a poem. I have no words except others for what's handicapping this body. I spent a week in the mountains. I never feel belonging, but they remind me they belong to no one. For millennia, they will keep surpassing this body. American media has popularized qi as the Chinese word for breath also a homophone for rage, for beginning, for the mountains held within this body.
And in light of all the destruction on the West Coast right now, my second poem was written thinking about climate change. And it's also kind of my love letter to California, my adopted home. When this is all over, here is what I will miss. Running through the park, even when I hated it, cursed my legs for their sourness. The heron walking into the pond, small white reflection emerging from the verdure. So lush it brushes the sky teal. Bees floating from poppy to lupine to cobweb thistle. Tender hum and churn like waves lapping the shore like language, like love, so certain. How could it be any other way? Even the fog, that cool gray mist stalking the shoreline, feeding redwoods, pale honey from a mercurial god, feasting on city lights in waning hours. And at the end, squinting into the bright ocean, once described by the Greeks as wine, because they didn't have words for the color blue, or there wasn't yet blue, or maybe they were drunk off its immensity. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next reader, Iris Jong. Iris Jong is a writer and comics artist based in Oakland. Iris is a co-founder of Comic Arts Los Angeles, an annual indie comics festival, and also leads the, pro the program team at Rivet School, a Bay Area education nonprofit. Iris's work can be found at www.irisstrong.com. Thanks, Jenny. I will be sharing two poems today. One, born in excessive time, in times of excess, the one who craves caters, before again capsizing a bear house, and before that, always seconds away from expiration. I failed to print a long, loose line in space. The space of one year is time piled headlong, a saint's accordion smash and period. I'd like to know who made and maddened you, stranger, for officially speaking, she hungers. You dared do the deed on flesh, a pink pearl less than I deserved. Now don't build me a house so I can live in it. Let me be a house, cups for holding light, like the old fashioned days, a room that takes its time, that lets you in. I'd like you so much better than what they sold me, this self-assembly required, pieces turned inside out, instants ticking, which never titillates, only wishes it were so. Two, tell me of a time the yoke bled cleanly, broke and became a fortune. A kingly dream that would be to come away with that kind of fortune. Grasses, heat, cicadas, desiring what little breath we have to give. A thousand fingers have licked this dice so dark it shines, our new fortune. Fattened calf-like beneath a sky that puckers, my would-be self retreats, skin skimmed by heaven's remains unclench your fist, this is no fortune. Rub, less car rub this charcoal lust, take the sourness of a forsaken day and don't look up. Don't look at all, scatter it and kneel, O ready fortune. Is it? I'll not swallow your shame. Pity me like a dollhouse master as his son strips me. Nobody ever foretold this act of fortune. How can green scald me so? The sky might open for me today, I lie but not always. A stone furred is decadence. Consider it fortune. Three knocks will curse the original reflection, one I've left unread. The call for pension wrenches, your hands a broken scale. Forget fortune. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, I don't have the words to express, I don't have better words than everyone else does to express how grateful I am for this program and how much it's changed my approach to writing and also to life in a really short span of time. 
Um, I wanted to share a couple pieces today that roughly um, discuss mm. alcohol addiction and healing. I think that it's been really special to be able to share and get feedback on these pieces in a like a community of color um, because it's so rare to be able to have these stories told in ways that are truthful to um, our experiences. This first piece is called, In Which the Poet Googles, Am I an Alcoholic? When was your first drink? Truth be told, I never knew what would come from me in ropes. In the beginning, it was all fun and games. I felt dizzy and I righted myself. I was prostrate and I slumped to standing. Do you recall feelings of isolation in early life? Only like a scorpion stings like a spider weaves its web, like a horse dances across deserts. I did what seemed natural at the time. Have you ever participated in reckless behavior while drinking? You're lying if you've never felt the thrill of a new body. The slamming flushed the doubt from mine. I desired the exchange of something, if not liquid, liquor, if not liquor. Do you ever drink alone? Don't ask me to give up my beating heart. I drank with my paintings, with my cooking, with men who left in the deep hours of night. Don't you ache for the sizzle of fresh flesh? Do you spend a lot of time obtaining, using, and recovering from alcohol? Once, mm. I dimmed the headlights of my car and reveled directly into the darkness. A catapult, a comet turned a light. Let me be among my rotting roses. Let me live in my simmering shadows. It's not the drink I long for. It's the quiet. That's one piece. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I have performance jitters for the first time since all of this happened. <laughs> the second piece is called um, In Which My Psychiatrist Asks, and You've Been Practicing Celibacy. Well, friend, yes and no. Yes, I went from starving to fasting. No, I did not drape my orgasm in faded sacrament. Yes, I felt the hunger consume, consume me in its own right. But no, I still touch myself and see God. Yes and no, I pulsed for bodies to distract me, disconcert me. And yes and no, I handed these reins to a grand and tremulous unknown. I don't know about celibate from the Latin unmarried, although unmarried I am and celibate I am too. But here, I'll catalog what I wanted before I divested from my own porosity. One, a shady place to stand. Two, a feast unburdened by salt. Three, to lie languid in fresh sheets, entranced by my own slippery nature by the scent of me, by the smell of newborn rain. Thank you so much for letting me share um, for this spectacular community. Um, it's really an honor to introduce next uh, one of my personal favorite poets. Preeti Vangani is an Indian marketing manager turned writer. She is the author of Mother Tongue Apologize, her first collection of poems. She works as an educator with Youth Speaks in San Francisco and is the editor of Glass, a journal of poetry. She loves movies, comedy, and French fries, but will not share them with you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Jason, Mihi, KSW for supporting all of us and especially being one of my first literary homes when I moved here in 2016. It has been such a pleasure to work with this cohort and our generous, wonderful teachers. Thank you, Vanessa, Barbara, Ah, this was so, so incredibly great. Ingrid, thank you so much. Um, I'll read two poems. The first one is also the one in the chapbook, um, which our beautiful class put together. Uh, it's called Breach. My mother says I was born on a holy Thursday, feet first. She loved to joke. She was so lazy, she wouldn't push her own head out of the womb. But I think I was born the day she lost me in the mall or I was born from the red lines of her grip on my wrist from then on. And again, I was born when my Nana gave me an extra peppermint tiki because I was his favorite. No, because he knew I was the most bullied of 14 cousins. 
soft like your mother, my nanny said. I bruise easy, my skin an Orion in purple and blue. Sucking on the minty coin, I was born in our sun-smeared balcony, playing alone. For a minute, I was Miss India. For a minute, Miss America, because who would want to be India when America was winning all the goddamn pageants? A drying bath towel was my sash. My nanny's comb was my crown. On paper too, I was born. If you lined up my report cards from kindergarten to masters, you'd be invaded by the sharp grace of only one letter. A, 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 an army of A's, a battalion of A's, a billion A's, like a war I had mastered, the only symbol that mattered, A. A teacher said I was a one-trick pony. My weapon was rote memorization. And it was. I'm born from what I remember and what I remember spills from inside me like my self-esteem leaking in the parking lot where I cried for another man. And the parking lot where I cried before shame walking to a chemist for a pregnancy test. Different man, different parking lot. I was born from what I did not birth. My lot is that my mother didn't remember my name the last time I saw her and I was unborn. I wanted my mother returned to me like she was a thing. Just say my name once. I steadied her memory thin hand as if coaxing a spoon into an infant's mouth. I wanted to write my name in big bold letters across the dusty walls of the hospital ward. My lot is that even as she disappeared, I wanted her to remember me. Look teacher, it's important to remember. But the drug, the disease, by this time she was more medicine, less mother. Did she lose me or did I lose her? In the mall, there was a pair of escalators. I screamed your name, she said over and over. I walked faster than those stairs, up, down, up, down. How ascension and dissension become mere myths under the mechanics of a repeating motion. Is there a better metaphor for rambling through grief? Walk me to it. I want an A in finding my mother. I will birth her, playing alone. Praying head down to the sun-smeared floors, I will push my head through all the slippery passages of absence. I won't ask her, I promise, if she remembers. Um, the second poem is a ghazal. Um, thank you, Barbara. It's my most loved form. My mom loved listening to ghazals, so it always feels special to write one. Meaning prayer. Who can hold what the dead leave behind, not even God, and earn a headstone this guilt-flooded road, so uneven God? You of stone, my mother, she dressed and fed you, spoke to you, of you, under and above you. You usurped her, being God. What could I do but substitute grief with desire, loss with lust? If I write an apology for all I swallow, I wouldn't believe in God. The fire subsided or was contained. When did I fall asleep? You poured me a large before you left. Love, neat, pity its smoke, like a fleeing God. How funny, we've got a hundred and eight gods and only one mother. I scribble her name, puja meaning prayer, meaning petitioning God. So I start over, dear mother. Thank you so much and thank you for listening to me. Um, and it is such a joy uh, to introduce our next reader, Lucy Pereira, who is a multiracial writer and educator. She is currently a programs coordinator at the nonprofit 826 Valencia, Go 826, where she teaches creative writing for under-resourced youth and has lots of debates about whether hot Cheetos are better than Takis. They are not. Um, a Bay Area native and former zoo employee, she loves fun animal facts and walks in Golden Gate Park. Welcome, Lucy. Thanks, Preeti. Um, and I really just want to echo all of the love and gratitude for Kearney Street Workshop, for the Asian Art Museum, for our three incredible instructors that we got to work with this summer, um, and for all of my fellow writers here. You're all amazing, and I've just been so happy to hear from you and learn from you. Um, I'm going to read two poems. This first one is called um, Watching Clips of the Republican National Convention. I keep hearing this story, fluorescent and booming, the story of a glorious nation built on God-given land with God-given wealth and God-given lives, 
where we all may enjoy our God-given rights. I think that God-given must be another word for stolen. I think that their God's love is limited to the language of gifts, but mine speaks in morning glories, in my family's group chat, and the turtles I count in Stowe Lake each afternoon, speaks these tongues with all the fluency of water. Beneath the red noise, something tender floats into the hazy apricot sky on the hunt for cooler colors and breathable air. Seeking to learn a new language, one in which we say God-given and mean sacred, one in which what is given cannot be taken. Um, I have one more, and this is the one that is going to appear in our class chat book. On his deathbed, my grandfather, a lifelong Catholic, refuses last rites. At midnight, my mother and I sit in a Denny's, drinking cheap rosé and eating breakfast food, en route to Vancouver Island to retrieve his ashes. At the crematorium, my grandmother cries and catches herself. It's not really him. Later, she shakes the urn over the blackberry brambles that border their garden, the farthest area from the house that could still be called home. I think maybe she says a prayer in a language unfamiliar to her ancestors, to a god they received like a Trojan horse. My mother and I pick raspberries while we watch her eat them from our fingertips. My father inside the house calls popular mechanics to cancel his father's subscription. Under the gaze of Ganesh, a shadow perched on the piano next to my graduation photos. The unbearable intrusion of a priest in the bedroom, grief sheltered in the shadows of the garden. This is far too intimate for God to watch. Thank you. I am so, so excited to introduce our next reader, Grace. Grace H. Joe is a poet and cultural anthropologist living in Oakland by way of Sichuan, Honolulu, and the Mid-Atlantic. Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Frontier Poetry, AAWW's The Margins, Quelly, The Hellebore, and elsewhere. She is a PhD candidate at Stanford University, where she, where she is completing her dissertation about intimate economies in Central Asia. Her work can be found at www.gracehjo.com, and I'll drop that link in the chat for you all. Um, take it away, Grace. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Lucy, um, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for being here. Um, I want to echo what everyone has said, just how grateful I am for KSW, Jason, Mihi, our instructors, Barbara, Ingrid, and Vanessa, for you know, creating this supportive space for all of us um, each week um, to the Asian Art Museum for organizing this event. And also, most of all, to this cohort. It's been, you know, just, I'm just so grateful for the camaraderie, the community, and the connection that we've had this summer that's been otherwise so difficult um, in so many ways. And today I'm gonna read two poems. Um, the first is dedicated to my grandmother. Um, I was realizing that she passed away this month last year and I wasn't able to go. And I've been thinking a lot about, you know, um, that kind of distance, especially as nowadays, this distance between family just feels so intractable. So this is called Wake. Here, the packed balconies on Market Street, rusted carcass of lawn chair and oversunned aloes blooming like anemones. There, your balcony full of green things, saltus, celery, your hands on the wrinkled skins of other vegetable shapes. Here, I do not sleep. Phone to ear, I hold vigil to my mother's voice smoothing your silk robes, your white chrysanthemum quilt. There, you do not wake when they give you to the fire, and your son holds up three pieces of you, ulna, rib, phalanges, fragments, proclaiming, from head to toe, she is whole. Here in the night, I want to be a small seed, there again, in your broad leaf side. Ease my child body back to sleep with your fingers connecting the dots of my scattered limbs.
And the second poem is um, one that will appear in the chat book as well, um, inspired by our poetry class with Barbara, Origin Stories um, was the prompt. And this poem is titled, The Luminous Interval. In the beginning was the word, not spoken, but hovering over a rise of whispers, a heave of humid silence in the cricket night, a great swallowing dark, where a girl followed a sister through rice paddies and rice paddies along the mud and tap down earth, past the canteen's lone light where the dead cook's corpse rested, his fingers pointing, you, you, a live reminder of his palm sting the afternoon you tickled him out of slumber. In the beginning was the word not voiced in the numinous night, brimming with things neither you nor I can name. As when the girl and her sister crept under cover of darkness to see the ruby-scalped woman swallowed by shadows, her luminous hair rivering through black engines on a factory floor, a name lost to memory, her body, mere body, shrouded in skin, a shape rigged with bone. In the beginning was the word, and the word was a dream the girl dreamed, on a path of shivering trees, the road to your grandmother's house where all your dreams lead. You saw me, a figure, at the end of a yellowing road, snow white goose in my arms like a secret, and you woke with an emptiness heaving your chest like something had been lost, like that brisk autumn encounter had been our last. In the beginning was the word, and the word was a girl, and the girl was you, mama. And I was part longing, part twine, between some other world and this one. I'd rather carry a darkness that is teeming, full of things we cannot name, than only speak the words of things I know to be still and sure. One night, far away from you, I look up and see the Pleiades showered in a hundred dissolving lights. One night, I am on a strand alone and dark waves lap my toes. Thank you. And so I'm so delighted to introduce next, um, Amy Huang. Amy is a New Yorker living in San Francisco. She writes across genres and was previously an organizer for Kearney Street Workshop's annual Aperture Arts Festival. She's not a morning person and likes to ease into the day with meditation and journaling. In her writing, she draws inspiration from her immigrant family and the experiences of diasporic communities. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Grace. Thanks so much for that introduction and for what you shared just now. Um, I woke up before 11 a.m. today, so I consider that a win given the hellish guys that we've seen this week. Um, and I am uh, really thankful um, for this community, for all of you showing up today to share this space with us. Um, thanks to the Kearney Street Workshop and Jason for making the program possible, to all of our instructors, Barbara, Vanessa, and Ingrid, for teaching us craft and for just giving us the tools to continually build our writing practices and build our creative writing lives. Um, I'm going to just read uh, from a work in progress. Um, okay. um, keep quiet with your footsteps, my father whispered from behind as my brother and I climbed the stairs of our Brooklyn apartment. It was the first time we were setting foot in our new home. 30 hours earlier, we had said goodbye to our grandparents in the dark before dawn. I would knelt before my grandmother and bowed like the sons did in front of their ancestors when they were about to set off on a journey from which return was uncertain. There are other people downstairs, my father explained. The people he spoke of were our landlords, a Cantonese family that I would later meet. The stairs up to our apartment rang hollow. It was as though they were made of cardboard, unlike the sturdy sandstone stairs of my grandparents' house where I grew up. We creaked our way upstairs in the dim light of a yellow bulb my parents lugging heavy canvas bags bound by tape and strips of red cloth. Each bag bore my father's name in an English address that I could not read. They contained everything my mother could pack 
under the baggage limits allowed by the airline, clothes, duck feather blankets, cotton jackets for the winter, a pair of kitchen knives that were supposedly better than anything that could be found in America, gifts that my mother promised to relay to the relatives we would see in New York. We were as prepared as we could be for life in Meigua, the beautiful country we had just left China for. My father flipped on the light switch in the apartment and revealed white walls, faded linoleum floors, and a bare living room with windows facing the brick walls of the house next door. I stepped across the threshold and felt the floor crinkle under my feet. It was like stepping on the smooth silver lining of a candy wrapper, and I cringed at its slipperiness. There were two bedrooms adjoined to the living room, and they both smelled of paint and dust. Each bedroom had thick purple carpeting that was too warm for the breezeless night. I peeked in the kitchen in the back and saw wooden cabinets, an old countertop, and the same linoleum floor as the living room. Where's the furniture? I asked. It'll come later, my father said. He had just signed the lease two weeks ago with money borrowed from a cousin and had little time to furnish the place since he was working six days a week at a restaurant. I bought beds, he told my mother, who was already undoing the bindings on our luggage, digging for clothes we could change into for the night. Our beds were stacked in a pile in the larger of the two bedrooms, three white mattresses wrapped in the plastic coverings they were delivered in. My brother and I watched as our parents moved the mattresses into each room. You must walk quietly now that we're on the top floor, my mother instructed. No running. She told us we could only play during the day, and even then we needed to lower our voices so we wouldn't disturb the family below us. I was nine years old, and I did not know what quiet play meant. My brother and I were used to running up and down the stairs of our childhood home, the sound of our steps hitting the smooth stone floors that were always cool beneath our feet. We didn't need to lower our voices. We could play freely indoors or outdoors on the road that ran through our street. Now in the smallness of this apartment, we felt like there were already too many rules we have to obey. That night, we slept on our mattresses without sheets. Our mother could not find them among our bags and it was already late by the time we changed and washed. There was too much to unpack to start organizing the pieces of our new lives. Our mother gave up out of exhaustion. I felt the plastic wrapping of the mattress wiggle beneath me and understood that I was now a Mi a moniker I heard adults use for immigrants who had come to America and lived like guests until they would someday return home. Wow. Um, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who has been here in this process, Kearney Street Workshop, for the opportunity to join the cohort. Um, Barbara Jean Reyes, Ingrid, and Vanessa, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your tutelage and for really paving the way for other uh, Black and Brown writers and women writers and uh, non-binary writers of color to really push forward and publish and talk about and write about the things that we're passionate about and in our lives um, because we don't have these spaces. Um, this was one of the most freeing and yet grounding experiences the entire summer in the midst of an uprising, in the midst of everything, and even with our state on fire, um, we show up for each other every single week um, and just hold the space. So just very blessed and um, for the audience, y'all didn't get to see these pieces evolve. And as a participant in the cohort, being able to see these pieces evolve, like everybody came in and was like, we don't know what we're doing. And then this is what we did. So I'm just sharing all the love. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Mihi. Um, and thank you, Asian Art Museum, for this opportunity. I'm going to get on into it. Uh, I'm doing a piece of creative nonfiction. It does not have a title. Beyonce Giselle Carter Knowles was shot in her bed in the early hours of the morning when sheriff's deputies executed a no-knock warrant on the incorrect house. 
Her drug dealer boyfriend was said to have fired on the officers promoting the barrage of bullets. It's unclear why Carter Knowles was driving so long before pulling over for the officer who'd signaled her some miles back, but she was able to make a phone call to her mother before being found hanging in her jail cell. While only 19 years old, the prominent Black Lives Matter activist was known to move crowds with her fierce voice, although facing unjust housing situations and sexual assaults after leaving the protests. She was last seen hitchhiking down a Florida highway before she was picked up by a man in a Buick. The 33rd trans woman murdered in 2020, Knowles' body was found dismembered in the marshes. Her loved ones say, the brokenhearted girl was grieving her mother knocking on several doors for assistance after crashing her car before being shot in the face by a homeowner who answered the door. A review of the singer's YouTube channel shows that she was aware that a lifetime of exposure to lead toxins had resulted in a learning disability, a contributing factor to her having quote unquote zero faith in this country and asserting herself and her children as sovereign citizens. During the six hour standoff with police, no efforts were made to de-escalate the situation, even though her boyfriend alerted officers that her son Cody was inside the apartment. After taking the daughter they shared and surrendering himself to police, it is unclear what prompted officers to storm the home. However, an astute student of daddy's lessons, Knowles' body was found behind the couch she'd used as a barricade and her five-year-old baby boy was taken to a nearby hospital for gunshot injuries. An interview with the child review revealed that officers had shot him intentionally. The famed athlete who runs the world almost died this afternoon after repeatedly telling her healthcare providers she had difficulty breathing after an emergency C-section to birth her daughter, Olympia. The greatest of all time has a prior history of, blood, of a blood clotting disorder. While she survived the ordeal, many of her expertly designed costumes also function as life-saving compression devices to protect her as she performs. Unfortunately, the multifaceted entrepreneur who spoke five languages, flew planes, and recreationally skydived left behind two children after seven liters of blood flooded her abdominal cavity after a second routine C-section. Although she'd repeatedly complained after the surgery, medical staff informed her husband that she was, quote unquote, not a priority after they'd implored the staff for over 10 hours to perform an abdominal CT. However, her husband describes the flawless mother of two as irreplaceable. Despite her screams being heard across the county, after the sensationalism of her fiance's death by officer shooting in the front seat of their car subsided, no one bothered to check in on the young, almost widowed, single mother who could never quite find the words to explain to their daughter why her father was murdered in front of her that day. After 16 years behind a partition for shooting her sex trafficker, Newly leaked hotel footage shows the dangerously in love mogul being beaten and choked until she's unconscious before her limp body is dragged out of the elevator and into an emergency stairwell. The crazy in love couple have had a hot and heavy handed relationship in which the singer was briefly hospitalized for injuries that included major bruising, swelling, a busted lip, a broken nose, and bite marks on her arms and fingers after a particularly nasty spat in their sports car. Most recently, her bow of 20 years shot her in both feet after a disagreement escalated, indicating that pretty hurts. Police arrived on the scene shortly after, finding the singer laying face down on the freeway to avoid an accidental execution. However, Despite putting her hands up in proper single lady fashion and announcing she was pregnant, Officer Friendly claimed he feared for his life before drawing his weapon and shooting her. Despite the fact that it took six fully grown men to hold her down while over 30 surgeries and experiments were performed without sanitation or anesthesia, the Queen Bee's contribution to scientific research has proven that Black women the world over have thicker skin and are impervious to pain. The bootylicious singer's buttocks, female parts, and breasts can currently be seen on display in Paris's Musée de Homme. It's been said that a crowd of over 150 men 
women, and children gathered and watched as Miss Knowles Carter was hoisted by her neck onto a branch of a proper height and thickness, her belly slit, and the destiny child that spilled upon the ground was stomped to death before her body was set aflame and burned until not even her teeth remained. While countless Black women die in this country every day at the hands of their partners, other men who look like us, medical providers, random neighbors, oxidative stress caused by racism, pernicious and well-meaning co-workers, and countless other ways associated with being Black and woman in America, it appears that only after the police shot Beyonce did the world get information and begin giving a fuck about Black women and girls, burning it down, and saying their name. Thank you. I would like to turn this back over to Jason and uh, he'll take us home. Thank you all. Awesome, amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, before we, uh, we, we did have a little time, we wanted to do a bit of a Q&A. Is my mic working? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, just making sure. Um, yeah, so uh, before we um, hop on and, and do this Q&A, there is a Q&A chat box, is a Q&A function. Uh, I should be able to access it so you can start populating questions if you have any. Um, but before we did that, we have two of our instructors here. Um, and if uh, Ingrid is able to pop on, you know, That'd be cool too, but I'm not sure um, that happened. But um, we have uh, Barbara and Vanessa, and I wanted to invite both of them to uh, say a couple words, uh, you know, if, if they feel so inclined. Um, so yeah, uh, Vanessa, would you like to start? Um, sure. Uh, that was amazing, and just the sort of light that we all need uh, right now, and. Um, I'm so grateful to have spent some time with you this past August and just the way that you always showed up for each other. And I know you'll continue to show up each other um, was so inspiring. So uh, thank you again. And I'm so excited to see everything that you'll be writing, continuing to write um, in the weeks and months ahead. So congratulations. All right. And uh, Barbara, would you like to add anything? That was straight fire. Thank you, folks. That was amazing. So just thank you for, well, for your trust, right? Um, I came into, uh, came into our, um, our poetry session and I saw these like, you know, kind of eyes fearful of poetry. And, um, you know, I was like, just trust, just trust, it'll happen. And I'm just so, so very, very pleased to see how willing you all were to well, hear one another, be there for one another, but take some amazing poetic leaps in the work and uh, just uh, handling some very difficult and um, uh, topics both personally and in the world, very important. And I'm just, uh, wow, wow. So I'm just, I'm happy and it's amazing. And you guys are just yell rock. Thank you. All right. All right, thanks Barbara and Vanessa. Um, so we got the, uh, we do have a question that uh, pops up into the q and I think it's for Honeybee. Um, Honeybee, where did, is from Joel Quackenbush, where did your inspiration for your piece come from? Um, hey Joel Quackenbush, that's my auntie y'all. Um, this piece just came out a lot of rage that I was feeling. It's like every time you log in, um, you're seeing something wild. And um, a lot of the rage that that's coming through is that we don't get the protests in the streets. Like there aren't very many buildings burning um, because of, you know, Renisha McBride being murdered when Corinne Gaines was murdered. Her GoFundMe actually collected received less than $20,000 in donations. Meanwhile, George Floyd's GoFundMe raised $2.5 million in about as many days. Um, and there's just so many ways that Black women are murdered and undervalued in this country. Um, we have Asia uh, Johnson who went in for a blood pressure issue and never left the hospital and she was pregnant. She was very happy to have her child. Kira Johnson uh, was ignored and the medical staff literally told her husband 
um, who is for key reform moms and took this to Congress that his wife was not a priority. And by the time they got to taking a look, she literally had bled into her abdominal cavity on the day that she gave birth to their second child. And she was an athlete in, you know, all of the things, all of the ways we can be the most powerful and successful and it's still not enough. Um, so that's where all of this came from. Um, each one of the instances that was included in this piece is a real life happening um, that has happened to a black woman um, and black identified woman. So um, we have a lot of work to do and this was just the best way that I could get it out. Thank you, Honeybee. So, um, you know, there's one question I wanted to ask uh, to the group. And I think like, you know, I mean, we've talked about this a lot and um you know it's the fact that you as a group you know you went through these three months through you know very it <laughs> through a very intense time uh in the world around you and also having to you know manage doing this um online week after week um how were you able to you know i think like you know a lot of people being creative and being able to work on on their art has been challenging for a lot a lot of folks so how were you able to to navigate going through this week after week anyone can feel free to jump in I can be the sacrificial lamb and jump in this time. It's usually Sarah. Um, <laughs> um, I got, I just got a lot out of this community. Um, I think it was really hard to create uh, most of this year. And for me, even a little bit before that. And just the sense of warmth and all the support provided by this cohort and our instructors was so helpful and such a gift. And I really loved that we could feel free to just play with words again um, and not take ourselves so seriously and everyone was just so kind and understanding um like every i think ritana mentioned earlier like every week we came in and there was just so much heaviness and we just acknowledged that uh very necessarily and that was really liberating Um, for me, you know, I think every week was different, um, just depending on my um, own mental and em emotional capacity for that week. Um, I, I think there was never like a pressure uh, to produce, uh, so, so to speak. Um, it was just more about um, showing up and, and coming into the space where we're doing whatever we can to to just um, find inspiration, spark creativity, and, and just experience the, the most human parts of ourselves. Um, so having that like environment uh, was really important. Um, and I think, you know, even for the weeks that I just wasn't in a place to write, uh, I was able to, at, at, at the very minimum, do all the readings that we were given try the the creative exercises and prompts that we were given so there was always something i felt that i could just um touch and and um kind of get into a, a creative something uh one way or another so i'm super thankful for that um you know it's it's definitely it wasn't easy and you know like i said it wasn't uh it wasn't like i wrote something every week it was just more like uh you know i was able to show up and, and do whatever i was able to and you know i i think all of our uh, wonderful instructors for giving us the permission to just show up and and do whatever we're able to and i think if i can jump in too i think part of what really excited me was that like 
we were making friends. <laughs> like uh, part of it was the excitement to be like, I want to show my friends something. And we were like writing together and we were sharing. Um, I feel like if anything, that was exactly what I needed during this time more than anything was like to feel like I was connected. And so to have um, a, a space that facilitated connection in that way was really helpful to get me to be like, oh, one way of connecting um, that feels very fulfilling to me is to write towards my friends and to write alongside them. And so that was that was very exciting for me, at least I think um, whether we were in person, meeting in person or not, I think that was absolutely something that brought me to the page over and over again, even if like whatever it was wasn't something I wanted to share in the end, at least it brought me to the page and it got me excited to hear what else was bringing, what was bringing folks to the page that week. All right, we had another question pop into the box from Regina. Uh, question for whoever would like to answer. What's the most surprising thing you learned in this workshop about craft, process, yourself, etc.? cetera? Anyone? <laughs> I know it's kind of hard. You got like fifteen people here, so you know when to jump in. <laughs> I can go, um, and I I think this might be true for everyone who is dominantly writing only in one genre. Is just the way this workshop is built is so unique um, that it exposes you to poetry, fiction, and then nonfiction. Uh, and one of the big discoveries I made was um, all of the strategies that folks were that our instructors were taking us through fiction and nonfiction, uh, how beautifully they could be applied to poetry as well. So I think it opened my horizons in terms of let's cross pollinate these ideas. What from poetry can I take? to an essay and um, what from character development can I take into nonfiction, for example. Um, and I think what it do, did was really just like, tell me that the toolbox is really infinite, you know, and you can borrow from anywhere. I mean, of course, we read cross genre, but to know how to break it down and to understand how you can uh, take it to the genre you dominantly write in was such a revelation. And I, I, I also, I think it, it, it was so beautifully timed. I mean, we are going through what we are and it's a world of chaos, but to, to sit with a different genre um, every other month sort of um, was what was brought, like what, what was what kept bringing me back in that I'm not bored, I wanna keep going and there's so much more to explore. Would anyone else like to take that question? Um, I think it was just so powerful the way that we could show up and be not expected to know everything. Um, I feel like in some creative spaces, there's such a fierce competition to like show how much you know, or you know, there's some sort of baseline you're quote unquote supposed to be at before you can um, be successful, you know, or quote unquote deemed successful in the space. And um, the mix of writing styles, whether it was through, you know, some in-class writing exercises or even just breaking down different form and function um, was so helpful. And the pieces that each instructor incorporated into our time together were really powerful because when you looked at it on the page, it was one thing, but then when we started unpacking it, there was another. Um, and so it's just so nice to one, not be confined to that really weird, inciting incident and rising action and then the conflict and all that kind of weirdness but it was really like there are shapes and there's forms and um actually i saw in the uh, comments that regina said grief is uh circular and we actually studied circular um poetry and circular writing so there's so many ways that we were able to pick and choose um and really gravitate to things and what is it intuitively um that one pushed our writing to develop in ways that I think we all took chances and played with, but also um, when you see it on the page and when you're actually interacting with it, it feels so validating to be seen and heard and respected and the critique that was given just took everything to the next level. Yeah, and if I, if I could jump in and add, I think um, one of the most powerful aspects of the act of crafting was the fact our instructors gave us so much freedom 
like Ingrid, Barbara, and Vanessa took such time and care in showing us so many ways of deconstructing words and deconstructing sentences and how that in and of itself could be a way for us to practice liberation within our own writing from a lot of the conditioning that we're already kind of walking into this work wondering like and what I'm doing is that good enough uh, and so I, I just really think um, having the container you know and I know that what I'm going to walk away is the container of IWL where I give myself the freedom to explore like where my words are going uh, without necessarily always you know deciding it's not good it's you know because I have this like message in my head that writing has to be a certain way and so I think um, you know we really had incredible instructors who really cultivated uh, this fertile environment for us to really let our imaginations run. Awesome, thank you. Um, would anyone else like to take that question before we uh, move on to the next one? All right, sounds good. So we uh, we do one more question that I think we can maybe uh, go around the circle um, to what you call it, close this out. Um, but before we do that, there's just a make quick announcement. Um, just to let you all know, there is and the class is coming out with a, um, a chapbook and that will be coming out this fall. So to keep up to date, please follow us on social media, check out our website, sign up for our mailing list at www.turningstreet.org. We got a lot of cool events coming up. We got uh, KSW Presents, our bi-monthly reading coming up in October. Um, we're still working out the details, uh, but our featured reader is going to be Arm Troy Wells. Um, and we also have a couple other different events. We have workshops coming up. We have a professional development workshop with Cynthia Lynn. You can check that out at our website. It's a four week workshop. And we also have a fiction workshop with Claire Light coming up in October. So please feel free to contact us if you want for more information. Also, me and Barbara will be reading at uh, Undiscovered SF or Undiscovered X. So to celebrate Barbara's newest book, um, Letters to Young Brown Girl. And so we'll be doing a reading conversation um at a uh, undiscovered online if you've been to the undiscovered night market in san francisco it's moving online we'll do a little section for that so yeah that's all coming up check out our website follow us on social media and this last question oh wait i know oh, sorry if, um we are going to close out with this question but i'm going to pop in some of the question that's been coming up into the chat box so you all can answer there but this last question for everyone is, uh, we want to go around, what is next in your writing journey? Why don't we start with uh, Ratana? Why don't you start and we'll go in the order. Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, I guess um, I'm, I'm just trying to carry these habits that I've picked up with everybody over the past several months um, and just just trying to maintain a writing schedule like every day like putting something down on paper um, and uh, yeah that's mostly it I'm 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 writing about um, uh, uh, I guess yeah some difficult stuff related to grief actually and how we remember uh, those that came bef before us in in a respectful way and um you know my family history is one of displacement i'm cambodian american i'm 1.5 generation so a lot of that history of grief is um directly experienced sometimes a lot of it is also just inherited in in a lot of weird ways so finding the language uh to to put that in a way that i've, I've told this group multiple times in a way that's just truthful um and and beautiful is is a challenge and, I don't think I'm going to be able to get anything done unless I like really commit to like doing something like every day on paper. And I, I think um, this program has given me uh, uh, definitely a lot of different ways forward to, to, to keep to a, a life of like writing. So um, hopefully more to come from me in the not too distant future. Oh, and then ECAT, I think you, uh, you came after me. 
<laughs> thank you. Uh, I tend to be very overambitious in what I want to do. I feel like I have books inside of me and <laughs> getting them out is really hard. Uh, and sometimes it feels like it's just a prayer to get words out. I uh, really love poetry and at the same time there's a part of me that would like to write a memoir about uh, the incredible activism that I've been a part of here in the Bay Area uh, because there's just been so many things that have happened in the decade that I've been doing uh, this work. Uh, and then there is another part of me that would like to write a um, survival guide to survivors of sexual violence and uh, have that be something that can just contribute to uh, sexual violence survivors building power and making change. So those are my dreams. We'll see how close I get to them. And the next person is Ali. Um, well, thank you so much for the questions and um, thank you to Mihi and uh, Jesse for asking us all what we're doing and what, we're at, what we'll be up to. Um, I will probably have to shift my attention back to the big film and TV projects that I'm currently developing, um, which is a 1960s feature film um, inspired by my family a Chinese immigrant family in Queens, New York, which I mentioned, um, which was mentioned in my bio called Queens um, and a narrative limited series about the story and murder of Vincent Chen. Um, but on the writing side, um, I was so inspired and encouraged by Vanessa and our co cohort to write a piece on my great grandfather who I mentioned in my piece today um, and I'm inspired by my father who recently in the last couple of years wrote a biography called Chasing the Modern about my great grandfather, which I'll also share the link in the chat as well. Uh, and I'll take it over to Sarah. I actually recently read an article by one of our instructors, Ingrid, um, who talked about how uh, the work of writing is not just the writing aspect, but what surrounds it as well. So the conversations you have with people um, the hard work of disciplining yourself to create those habits to show up to your desk and um, just the life you lead like all of that is still a part of the work of writing so I feel like um, I guess what's next for me is honestly to try to keep this community alive <laughs> uh, we, we've set up some structures to meet still meet regularly and show up for each other um, and uh, that, that's a challenge also for myself as well to, to show up to myself and also to these amazing new friends. Um, so, so there's, there's that. And uh, I really would love to lean into playing more with writing rather than being so driven by uh, a need to be productive with it. I think especially being in my mid thirties, I feel like I need to have something to show for all this time that I've invested. And um, I, I, it makes questions. How do I lean into these new voices that have kind of taken up space in my life? So, yeah, uh, on to Antman. Hey, folks. Yeah, to echo Sarah, I think keeping the circle going, keeping my habits going, because I do like to think of like how I write is how I do everything. Um, which part of, part of that for me is also like exploring what poetry. Uh, Antman with neon green hair writes um, because I've only ever wrote poems as Antman with black hair. Um, so <laughs> but also <laughs> on an actual note, I'm working on um, a couple of manuscripts I think are floating around my brain. Um, the first one that I'm working on right now is about um, poetry about making out with the end of the world. And I hope to also write a zine about being an abolitionist, uh, but also a survivor of a hate crime, a violent hate crime, and like my experience with um, a criminal justice system as it is. So those are the kind of two projects I'm like noodling on at the moment. Um, and that is me, yeah, Neon Green. <laughs> and I'll pass it on to Jenny. Thanks, Catlin. Well, I saw so excited to see what you guys create. Um, 
So I am excited to keep this community going as well. Um, and as far as my projects was, as mentioned in my bio, I have a first poetry collection uh, called Focal Point that I'm shopping around. Um, and I and I'm constantly tweaking a little bit. Um, and that was largely written when I was in grad school um, and is about grief and growing up and was trying to be a person in the world uh, holding that grief. Um, in addition to that, uh, I am excited to do some more work on essays again. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, for empowering us to do that. Um, and I am very, very slowly, painstakingly, uh, translating my late mother's memoir of her, of growing up during the Chinese Cultural Revolution um, from Chinese to English. Um, and I think just in light of the political climate and the times we find ourselves in, it feels more relevant than ever before. Um, and I think next is Iris. Um, so I don't typically write poetry. I actually usually draw comics and write fantasy and comedy. So I will probably go back to that, although poetry may spring up in my life someday again. Um, I have like a draft for a fantasy story that is um, half finished that I might go back to about relationship anarchy. Um, and then I have an idea for a zine around the like bodily challenges of quarantining. Um, but I want to make it funny because it's really not and I need some kind of angle to make light of it. Um, oh, and then I'm taking a, an online head anatomy drawing class in a month because I want to up my technical drawing skills. I'll pass it off to Manami. Hey y'all, thanks so much again for the space. Um, I'm actually really excited to go back to reading a little bit more. I feel like I was able to learn so much in this class about writing and especially in fiction. I mean, that was so new for me um, and learning about, you know, all the different tools um, that, you know, the authors and writers are employing under the surface that I don't really notice. Um, so I'm just really excited to, to go back and read and, and also to write some more. So thank you all so much for the space. Um, and I'll pass it off to Sagari. Yeah, I just want to echo the appreciation for like the investment that y'all have put into all of our work, both in terms of this program and in terms of this question. Um, I'm working on a couple chat books, or I, I have one chat book called Shrines that I'm um, kind of, as Jenny said, shopping around, and I'm working on one, um, another called uh, Tentatively Longing and Other Family Heirlooms uh, with my very close friend, Arthi Warrior. Um, and um, that's on like how sh family shifts from family of origin to queer family and sometimes shifts back to family of origin. Um, so I, I also um, just started grad school. So as of two weeks ago, I attend Zoom University full time. So I'm like, you know, busy and, <laughs> um, you know, really trying to make time for my writing. Um, but I, one of my most, one of the things I'm most excited about with um, working on these chat books is sending them around to the IWL listserv and being like, who's got feedback? Who's got thoughts? Um, I'm really excited for that moment I get to do that. <laughs> and I will pass it on to um, Preeti. Thank you. I, I love this question. Like someone said, it's great to know what um, others are up to. I'm also trying my best to stay um, connected with the community. And I love the work that so many of us have put in um, to keep it going. Um, yeah, thank you for creating that and for KSW to give us that. Uh, I think I come from a culture uh, of strict overperformance and where a lot of your value is attached to the work that you do. Um, and I'm trying to actively change that. And it's really hard for me going off the A's I mentioned in my poem. Uh, so I'm trying to teach myself kindness and trying to say that it's okay if you're in your mid thirties and you haven't produced much and it's, it's extremely hard um, to get that going. 
Um, having said that, I'm working on a manuscript of poems that's tentatively titled Home Science, uh, which tries to um, dissect the workings of arranged marriage and middle class families and nuclear homes. Um, and I'm also working on a novel uh, which is tentatively titled The Body Remembers. Now, it basically means I'm going to work on it for the next 10 years. So that's where I'm at. It could either be uh, from the sounds of it right now, absolutely like a bad romance burner uh, or high literary fiction. So I need everyone to pray for me that it's the latter. Um, uh, yeah, um, so that is that. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to Lucy. Yeah, uh, thanks for this question. It's something that I haven't actually thought about that much. So good to get my brain jogging right now. Um, yeah, I think something I really appreciated about um, this summer and all of the um, instructors really asking us, like, who's your audience and who are you writing for? Um, I think that's something we talked about a lot, especially with Ingrid. Um, and I'm kind of feeling like maybe it's okay to just write for myself for a while um, and not feeling super pressured to like put my work out into the universe quite yet. Um, but I do, at the beginning of quarantine, my friend and I started working on a, a zine together um, and we're putting together a volume two over the next couple months. Um, so that's what's in the works for me in terms of writing. Um, I also said at the beginning of this that I really wanted and appreciated this space because um, in my day job, I help very tiny humans write um, and so focus a lot on other people's writing um, and really appreciated having this space to focus a little bit more on myself and my own voice. Um, so that's something I'm gonna try to, to carry with me going forward. And I'll pass off to Grace. I love hearing um, everyone's answers to this because it's just so inspiring um, what everyone is doing and how you're thinking about this. For me, um, in the immediate future, like in the next few months, I have a dissertation to finish that's basically eight years in the making. So, um, but it's been actually really great to, I think especially the fiction and creative nonfiction workshops have been really great for re-energizing re um, the way that I'm thinking about it, you know, and, and thinking about narrative technique and storytelling character but development and bringing all of that into, you know, something that, you know, has the potential to be a very dry and boring text, um, which I don't want it to be. So um, I think, after that, um, you know, I'm, I, I want to be kind of slowly putting together my first poetry manuscript as well, um, which is, um, you know, sort of thinking about what it means to be an immigrant in a settler colonial nation and kind of like retelling a diasporic history of the West, American West. Um, so, yeah, that's just sort of like just being in that and not, you know, like being within the poems. Um, and, and just kind of like living in that space for a while is something I look forward to doing. I'm gonna pass it on to Amy. Oh, thanks Grace. Um, yes, I think for me, uh, the most immediate next um, goal is to just finish uh, drafts for all the essays that has been in just fragments over the years um, and put that together and, and find a way to get them out into the world. Um, and then uh, echoing what everyone else has said, just continuing to, to be part of this community and um, commit harder and more to, to writing and uh, getting myself to write more regularly. Um, with that, I'll pass it on to Grace Lee. Hi, um, I kind of just want to finish all of the works in progress that I have, because <laughs> there's too many now, um, including in college, I wrote um, a senior thesis, which was like a collection of short stories about Chinese American girlhood um, called In the Violet. And I'm like really attached to that title. So I really want to revisit that collection and actually make the pieces good this time. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's what's next. Um, Honey Bee? Uh, whew, let's see what's next. Um, I am going to build out this Beyonce piece. This was literally like my first draft. Um, so I want to build that out. And then there's another essay piece that I want to um, do that's more 
I guess, uh, heady around this piece. So if the Beyonce piece was a, uh, an essay with more um, facts and figures and all that kind of, you know, more academic-y. Um, but yeah, so I'm also in school. I am wrapping up my science prerequisites to um, apply to midwifery school, which is also why I'm hosting a fundraiser. And so I'm in like two science classes right now. I am in applications mode. And then also um, I published a piece in our chat book, which was a science fiction piece and started two more science fiction-y pieces um, while in this program. So I wanna keep like writing and having a lot more uh, creative fun. And uh, hopefully, you know, within the next year, I'll be starting midwifery school and also continuing being an artist. Uh, and last but not least, as I also work at the African American Art and Culture Complex, also shout out to Melanie Malora and some of the other folks who I work with for being here today. Um, I want to build in some artistic exhibitions and that are exploring, you know, what it means to birth um, or not as people in this country and particularly as black people and black birthing folks in this country and what it means to create safety as well for us or what does it mean to not be safe. So those are a few of the higher level pieces that I want to work on over like the next few months in between homework and food and taking care of my cat. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Um, Give it up in your own way to all the uh, readers for tonight, all of our 2020 IWL uh, class. Um, thank you all for attending. And yeah, just again, check out our website, courtesy.org, support Asian Art Museum. Oh, also, if you, go to Asian Art, if you go to our website today, Jenny wrote a blog post for us about her experience with IWL. And yeah, and uh, it's gonna be, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff coming up. So cool. Thank you all. Bye, thank you all. Bye, y'all.